I'm Marty Moss Cohen. You're listening to Radio Times here on WHYY. Speaking from the Oval Office on Sunday night, President Obama called on Muslim leaders to confront extremist ideology of groups like ISIS. He said the terrorist group's followers were thugs and killers who were part of a death cult. Muslim leaders here and around the globe have to continue working with us to decisively and unequivocally reject the hateful ideology that groups like ISIL and al-Qaeda promote, to speak out against not just acts of violence, but also those interpretations of Islam that are incompatible with the values of religious tolerance, mutual respect, and human dignity. He then declared that it was the responsibility of all Americans to reject discrimination against Muslims in this country. It is our responsibility to reject religious tests on who we admit into this country. It's our responsibility to reject proposals that Muslim Americans should somehow be treated differently. Because when we travel down that road, we lose. That kind of divisiveness, that betrayal of our values, plays into the hands of groups like ISIL. Muslim Americans are our friends and our neighbors, our co-workers, our sports heroes. And yes, they are our men and women in uniform who are willing to die in defense of our country. We have to remember that. Yesterday in South Carolina, Donald Trump was called for a database to track Muslims and claimed to have seen thousands of Muslims celebrating after al-Qaeda attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon went one step further with this outrageous and appalling statement. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Joining us here in our Philadelphia studio is Muqtadar Khan, associate professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Delaware, where he founded the Islamic Studies Program. He's also co-founder of the Delaware Council on Global and Muslim Affairs. And Muqtadar Khan, nice to have you back with us on Radio Times. Thank you for having me, Marty. You're very welcome. And joining us by telephone is Shahed Amanullah. He's a community leader, entrepreneur, founder of several new media startups, including Athenis Labs that focuses on nurturing Muslim talent and businesses with positive social impacts in Muslim communities. He was a senior advisor for technology at the U.S. State Department, also editor-in-chief of altmuslim.com. That's an online news magazine covering issues related to Islam in the West. And Shahed Amanullah, nice to have you with us on Radio Times as well. Wonderful to be with you. Uh, Muqtadar, if I can begin with you, uh, the president talked about the dangers of playing into the hands of ISIL is what Donald Trump saying playing into the hands of ISIL? Yes, he seems to be the the, the biggest spokesperson for ISIL at the moment in the West. Uh, his comments, uh, his atrocious comments, which are so hateful. Uh, if any Muslim cleric were to make these kind of insightful statements, they would be locked away permanently as inciting terrorism and violence. But he seems to be running his campaign as a campaign which is based on hateful statements. But it's statements like this which alienate people, young Muslims, who feel that uh, no matter what we do in this country, we will always be treated as the enemy. And, and then they become fodder for people people who are recruiting for ISIL. It's not just that the fact that they may not everybody get radicalized, but what is more dangerous is that while a tiny fraction may get radicalized, a large segment of the Muslim population is frightened, uh, is alienated, and they feel disenfranchised. And so your biggest ally against ISIL is, is impoverished and diminished in its capacity to act in the defense of this country. So when President Obama says we should fight ISIL, uh, we need everybody to strengthen us, not weaken us. Well, Shahed, let me get you in on the conversation, a, a variation on that same kind of question. It is interesting and I think encouraging that there's been so much criticism of what Donald Trump said. But nonetheless, we heard the applause. We know where he stands in the Republican Party. How do you view him and, and, and his statements about Muslim Americans and about Muslims around the world? Well, look, I mean, in the wake of the attacks in Paris and also the attacks here in Southern California, uh, I understand why people are afraid. And, and, and uh, Trump understands that. He's a consummate you know, reader of the, of the audience, and he's playing into that fear. Um, the, what 
people don't realize is that, you know, there are millions, and the numbers vary, but there are millions of Muslims um, that have been of a part of the fabric of this country for decades and have been extremely productive. And, you know, but the, but the lens that Trump uses is, is purely the lens of terrorism. And so in order to counter that, um, well, the good the good part about what's happening is that it is forcing people uh, to to say things that maybe they wouldn't otherwise have said. So it's really refreshing to see um, other Republican candidates being forced uh, to the table to to say exactly where they stand. I mean, this is this is a if this is going to be a litmus test, let's use it as a litmus test to show which people stand for American values and which people don't. Shahid, let me go back to you and, and Mukhtar. I'd like to have you weigh in on this as well. And uh, after the Paris attacks, uh, Paris attacks, Shahid, there was talk about how. Oh, in Europe, um, Europe has not integrated Muslims Muslims into their society, into their country the way America has. Would you say that America has done a better job than some of our counterpart countries in Europe, Shahed? Well, you know, one of my tasks as a senior advisor at the State Department was actually to go uh, to Europe and other places around the world and interact with Muslim communities, particularly Muslim minority communities and particularly Muslim youth communities. And uh, what I saw there was really telling. I saw groups of young people that so desperately wanted to belong, as any young person does. They, they desperately wanted to feel like they were a part of society. But the way those societies are structured um, just wouldn't allow them to. And it, it gave me a renewed faith in the way that our country is structured so that, you know, the day – the day you become an American, if you're an immigrant, or just the day you're born, if you know you're born here, you feel American. Um, it is it is something that is just ingrained in this country, and and often I would see a lot of hand wringing among uh, my uh, diplomatic colleagues in Europe about what to do with the situation. And mm. you know, frankly, I would just say you know you need to be more like America. How do you see that, Mukhtar? There are two things. One of the biggest differences is that the governments in Europe have tried to integrate Muslims uh, and. The U.S. government has done nothing, which means the culture is doing a better job uh, than the government. Uh, than the government. And I think that is the, the key to understand. The second aspect is that in Europe, Muslims are not just religiously different. They are the religious other and the racial other, which means that Islam is the second biggest religion uh, and most prominent second religion of Europe. And Muslims are the African-Americans of Europe, whereas in the United States, that's not the case. So Muslims are neither the religious other nor the racial other. So in that sense, uh, they have been uh, kind of under the radar. So, for example, even today, uh, anti-Semitic acts are far, far more than Islamophobic acts. Maybe there's a reporting issue, but still. So this country, in spite of so much of Jewish integration, is still more anti-Semitic than it's Islamophobic. But also the nature of immigration is different. Uh, immigrants to the United States States have been far more educated, so they are either becoming white or on the fringes of becoming white. Uh, that's not the case in Europe. But do you fear, Muktadar, that um, there will be an increase in Islamophobia? Certainly after September 11th, there, there was an increase and there was an increase in attacks on, on Muslims. And, and, and Do you think we're at a similar see, juncture see, now? I expect it to increase more because... Uh, ISIL is not going to disappear. And if ISIL disappears, ISIL is Al-Qaeda 2.0. I fear what is Al-Qaeda 3.0. There something are some, worse than yeah, something worse than ISIS. Yes, something worse than ISIS can happen. So we, we should be prepared for that. But uh, we should also not exaggerate uh, the nature of Islamophobia in the U.S. The Islamophobia in the United States is rhetorical and discursive at the moment. It is not it's like words. in Europe where it is embedded in government policies and culture. But what I fear is that if mainstream leaders resort to Islamophobic rhetoric, then it could, God forbid, translate into violence and systematic discrimination. Uh, I hope that that better uh, sense prevails. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, in that sense... Um, Donald Trump's uh, candidacy, uh, you know, the way I think of it is, this is huge, you know, <laughs> it will make America less him. great. <laughs> That's what it's going to do. And I think more and more uh, Americans will soon realize that it is people like Donald Trump who bring shame and scorn to America than anybody else. And I think that might turn the tables on Islamophobia. Shahid, the, the president and others, frankly, but the president on Sunday night really called on Muslim leaders to uh, to criticize and and um, stand up against uh, the kind of extremism that we see from some of these terrorist acts and certainly from ISIS itself. Does that seem like an appropriate thing for Muslim leaders to do, to speak out? 
Well, look, I mean, let's take a look at the progression of Muslim communities in America since 9-11. Um, in, in the wake of 9-11, there was pretty much a zero tolerance policy within mosques and Muslim institutions for anything that would bring, you know, shame to those communities or bring law enforcement in or just cause problems. And the, anyone who espoused those kinds of views went underground, went on the Internet and things like that. So there's really – these people are persona non grata in, in, in the – you know, uh, 2,500 mosques in America. And by the way, we had only 1,200 mosques in America in the days after 9-11. We have about 2,500 mosques now. So Muslims have proven to be very resilient. Um, so, the, but, the, but the problem is this. Even the people who are looking at this, what happened in San Bernardino, even the people who were around that person didn't have enough to act upon. Um, they, they, they didn't sense anything. They didn't feel him. Now, does that mean that Muslims need to be much more aware of what their neighbors do? I, I actually think that that's the case, not because of, uh, you know, because of violent radicalization, but because it's just good community policy. We should be we should be aware of what our neighbors are going through. We should be aware of their needs um, and, and, and be able to outreach. And for that, we need capacity. So in Muslim communities, for example, we need more mental health capacity. We need more counselors. We need more uh, youth uh, tutors. We need these kinds of people uh, trained so that they are sensitive enough to pick up on not the violence, but simply someone's about to go off the tracks just mm. to let them know that to be a good civic uh, in, and engaged civic citizen, um, that these are the things you need to do and, and direct that kind of passion and energy elsewhere. Well, I was looking at uh, Pew Research Center, uh, looked, at, our, looked at, at how Americans view Islam and more Americans than in times past or at least in recent times past believe that Islam encourages violence. So the question is, should Muslim leaders uh, stand up against this violence, whether it's in, the, in this country or in another country, be, to, to challenge the idea that more Americans believe that this is a violent religion? Well, there are two aspects to it, uh, uh, Marty. One is that uh, it is very difficult for anybody in the United States or in Europe to control what goes on in Iraq or what goes on in, in Pakistan or other parts of the Muslim world. Uh, politicians, political forces in those countries use whatever they need to legitimize themselves. And in the absence of any other vision which can legitimize their politics, they resort to Islam. So I could... Sh- shout hoarse saying this is un-Islamic, as Muslim scholars have been saying that ISIL is is not Islamic. And ISIL will claim and use sources from the literature to distort. It is important for us the way we interpret and report these events. For example, in this year alone, there have been 355 instances of gun violence, and nearly 460 people have been killed. Uh, None of these events are attached to questions which ask questions about American culture. What kind of country is this? What kind of people are these? Is this a murderous nation that shoots its own people? We have killed 280,000 people since 9-11 in gun violence, and we ne- don't see this as problematic at all. It's only when... We don't? In the sense that we don't impute it to our culture. It's just a political law issue. It's uh, associated with uh, the Second Amendment, etc. But when it comes to one shooting in San Bernardino, it's suddenly the entire religion and the entire Muslim community is culpable to it. Uh, I, I want to say that Muslim Americans have, in part, has done a great job uh, in, in trying to integrate Muslims. What they have done is they have shut down the, the negative rhetoric, if there was any, in the mosques, etc. But what is happening is that there are people who, who are called unmosked in the sense that they do not engage with the Muslim community. They don't come to the mosque. And for them, their religion and their sources is, are on the Internet where they are listening to other people overseas. And that is something that uh, it's very difficult for us to do. Let me give you one example of what we did last week on December 5th. We had this massive conference on social justice. In Delaware. In Delaware, uh, organized by Muslims. A lot of Muslims showed up, but a lot of non-Muslims showed up. But what was Im- remarkable is that nearly everybody who is a leader in Delaware, the governor, Senator Copper, uh, Congressman Carney, then uh, Tom Gordon, who's the executive, the police, everybody was there, and we spent a whole day interacting. It was as if Delaware was embracing its Muslims. Now, that eliminated 
this a sense of alienation if people have had, they feel they belong. And what was important was that these leaders discuss serious issues, not just Muslim issues. They discuss serious Delaware's problems there. And so we, since we began to see ourselves as solutions to America's problems, we feel integrated and part of it. And I think that is what I think the next step that Muslims have to do is to 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 become part of the solutions to America's problems, not mm. just be on the fringe of Muslim issues. Like on gender issues, you should say women should not just talk about women's issues, but about all issues. And I think Muslims have to do the same. Uh, Shahed, l- let me quote somebody. Uh, this is uh, Tanzila Ahmed, a writer and activist, host of uh, the hashtag Good Muslim, yeah. Bad Muslim. This is a podcast uh, who said, it's just not fair to Muslims to have to bear this responsibility of condemning when there are so many other violent acts occurring in America. No other community Communities asked to do it. We don't uh, make police condemn all acts of violence perpetrated by cops. Only people of color are expected to bear the responsibility of a larger group in this way. Do you do you agree with what uh, Tanzila Ahmed said? Um, uh, y- yes, I do. But, but here, you know, and Tanzila is a good friend of mine. She's a she's a great commentator on these issues. But I think it's a much more complex issue. So let's just passionately look at condemning. Right? Um, if we're asked as Muslims to condemn. Um, what the first thing is psychologically that puts us, that otherizes us, it puts us outside the fold of American community. Secondly, um, we know that ISIS doesn't care if we condemn. They, they really could care less. Um, so at the end of the day, so it doesn't move the needle on protecting us. It doesn't move the needle with respect to ISIS or their fanboys or, or people like that. Um, it is really just a salve for people to feel like something's happened when something really hasn't happened. And so what I want people to understand about this whole condemning thing is that I want, I'm interested in solving the problem. If it's just about making you feel good, then this is a false mm. sense of security. But if you really want to solve the problem, let's have a much deeper conversation about things. And Muqtadar um, referenced, I think, what the real problem is, is that the bulk of this is happening you know, in these closed spaces, in the dark web, on online, on social media. And uh, they're, they're not in done in a way that we can effectively monitor them. You can, you can come up with a filter for pornography. You can't come up with a filter for ideology. And this is the problem. Um, so so this, at the end of the end, you can play whack-a-mole all you want with Twitter accounts and websites and things like that, but it doesn't confront the ideology. So what needs to happen is there needs to be an empowerment of people to, to be able to, to cultivate narratives, to cultivate expressions in ways that attract this very same group of people in the way that they're being attracted right now. So there's something about the ISIS narrative that attracts them. Let's ask ourselves, what is it about that narrative that's attractive? And can we come up with an alternative positive identity that brings uh, that same group, group over to our side? Well, and, and we're almost having a break here, uh, and, and just I had a, a quick follow-up before we have to take this break. In terms of that narrative, the president called it a death cult. I mean, this is a very dark narrative that seems to be attractive to certain people. Uh, well, there's always going to be nihilistic people in every group of people. I mean, you know, this this country is, suffers mass shootings all the time by really disturbed individuals, mm-hmm. and Muslims have to be given a little bit of leeway to have mentally ill and crazy people in our communities as well. Not everything is, is, is done by a sober individual that's thinking nationally. So we need to solve these problems as a community, not just as Muslims. And that's uh, Shahed, uh, Shahed Amanullah, also with us, uh, Muktadar Khan. And we are talking about, uh, frankly, what a lot of the country is talking about these days, uh, having to do with uh, Muslim Americans and uh, some of the uh, religious uh, discrimination and also some of the, the, the religious uh, ideology of ISIS. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Radio Times here on WHYY in Philadelphia. I'm Marty Moss Cohen. In an address from the Oval Office on Sunday night, President Obama called for Muslim leaders in the U.S. and across the globe to speak out against violent interpretations of Islam, speaking directly about ISIS or ISIL. He also asked all Americans to reject religious discrimination against Muslims. We're talking with Muktadar Khan, associate professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Delaware, and Shahed Amanullah. He's a community leader, entrepreneur, founder of several new media startups, and was a former uh, senior advisor for technology at the U.S. Department of State. And we have calls coming in at one 877 9499 A lot of comments, Radio Times at whyy.org. And you can tweet us at whyy Radio Times. Mukhtar, you wanted to talk about this 
condemnation or the yes. condemning. Yes, uh, Shahid probably also remembers that I was one of the earliest Muslims to condemn 9-11, and I wrote an essay called Bin Laden Go to Hell, and I received a lot of backlash from the Muslim community at that time. See, the point with this condemnation is not that we issue the same statement with just changing the name of the organization or the date of the event and say, oh, we condemn this, this is un-Islamic. But what we really need to do is to engage with the theological arguments that groups such as this use. So, for example, if you look at the burning of the pilot, of the Jordan, Jordanian pilot that the ISIS, they end it with quotations from scholars, a very prominent Muslim scholar. That scholar is very popular in the United States. Ibn Taymiyyah's teachings are taught very widely in the United States and Europeans. Now, I would like Muslim scholars to contextualize this and mm-hmm. have to come out and say, yes, ISIL is also using this scholar, but I don't want you to, to, to understand this or well, was Ibn Taymiyyah wrong or was he right? We need to address those ideas. Uh, ISIL and Al-Qaeda use verses from the Quran and traditions from the prophetic traditions, etc. We have to engage that. If we don't, and if we look superficial, then young Muslims growing up think that uncles in the mosque don't know anything about Islam and these you know, Islamically dressed people on YouTube are better scholars of Islam because... Well, their Arabic is at least better. So it is very important that we have to dull the charisma of these. uh, It's it's, it's the the same for Americans. They have to challenge the charisma and uh, and the rubbish that Donald Trump and Ben Carson are spewing by facts and, and, and rational arguments. And I think that is what President Obama is calling Muslims to do, to go out there. And another task that Muslims should do is not get ghettoized, sending their kids only to Islamic schools and where they are only taught about Islam. They need to know more about America. They need to interact with Jews and Christians and atheists. And they need to understand that this country is their country too. And so we need to teach Muslims, especially the immigrants, wants a lot more about the history of America. Mm. For example, how many people know that Muslims died in the Civil War? Uh, You know, not many people know how many people know that Jefferson used to read the Quran and so on and so forth. And when we learn about America and its its incredible history, you really feel proud of this country. and, 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 And that perspective changes once you start becoming an American, both in heart and mind. Uh, it's very difficult for those children to get radicalized. And I think that is an important function that we have to play. We may not have the resources, but we need help from mainstream communities and increasingly uh, the interfaith community. Rabbis and Christian priests are doing a great job of dragging and helping the Muslim community to come into the mainstream. Shahed, is that a message you think that would resonate with young people that seem, for whatever reason, to be attracted to this extreme, and I have to say, violent ideology? If you do what Muqtadar says, which is, you know, educate people about uh, Muslims in this country, the history, what this country is about, is that something that would, that would prevent someone from joining a group like ISIS? We, we haven't we haven't had a proper conversation with Muslim youth for multiple reasons. So one is because uh, the vast majority of Muslim scholars who are preaching a, a you know a mainstream kind of moderate uh, version of Islam don't uh, you know you'll see them like giving talks on YouTube for an hour, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas the the you know the extremists are using social media memes, graphic imagery. Twitter size, you know, uh, bits of information. They're where young people are, and mainstream scholars are simply not. Uh, and so, what we need to build capacity for people to do that. So, for example, um, I helped organize a, uh, a hackathon um, in May where we brought a couple hundred of the world's you know biggest Islamic scholars together and tried to, to come up with initiatives that could kind of translate their work for the Twitter generation. Because this, these these people are hungry. They go out to the internet. They they they, they find answers that people aren't, aren't 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 addressing in their local communities. I was talking to one Muslim scholar who was telling me that in the wake in the wake of nine eleven, uh, Muslim scholars didn't want to talk about the concept of jihad because right. they didn't want to be misinterpreted or something like that. But in the absence of, of you know, we we kept on telling people what jihad wasn't, but we didn't tell people what jihad was. And in the absence of that, ISIS comes and says, "This is what jihad is." And, 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 and unless you're there to, to give that context and say, you know, that jihad does mean to struggle for righteousness and you know, the things that the vast majority of Muslims believe, which are peaceful and which are, 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 are meant to build a better society, 
um, they're going to take that line and they're going to run with it. Um, so we need to we need to double up. We need to have difficult conversations with our young people. We need to talk about stuff that 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 we haven't been talking about for a decade. You know, Shahid, go ahead. Shahid is making a very important point. We are there are two things happening simultaneously. There is this radicalism that we need to fight, which is a security threat. But there's also Islamophobia that is on the rise. What Islamophobia is doing is it's scaring the hell out of mainstream Muslim scholars. We are afraid to step out and, and, and tell people that this is not. For example, last Friday in, in pursuit of this social justice conference, I was talking about a verse which say, in which God says, what's wrong with you people that you will not stand up and fight for the poor and the marginalized and the oppressed in the Quran? And the word in the Quran is fight. So when I invoke that verse, a lot of ladies came to me after the sermon and says, you should have made sure that you should have used the word struggle and not fight. fight I said, too- I, yeah, she, they said that I would have encouraged Muslim youth to fight. I said, but the Quran does use the word uh, fight, not struggle. So, but... There's nothing wrong in in saying that you know that we should stand up and fight for the rights of those who are marginalized and those who are impoverished. So what is happening is that there's a lot of self censorship going on in 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 voices who can be the antidote to extremist voices, and that that silencing is coming from the targeting of Muslims, mainstream Muslims by groups uh, who are talking about uh, Islamization of America and stuff like that. So these hate groups are actually assisting the radicals by completely disenfranchising the very scholars and activists who could fight against them. And and you're saying, what I hear you both saying is that Scholars and others need to not just step up, but really do that next step, which yes. which is to explain. Because there's just a lot of either ignorance or fear, or just the fact that people are not not versed yes. in. Yeah, you know, and there are also lots of conspiracy theories going on, which we need to be able to challenge and 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 and, and confront. Let me see. What, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's go ahead. It's a just it's a dysfunctional conversation. Um, there's a dysfunctional conversation happening within Muslim communities, and there's a dysfunctional conversation happening outside Muslim communities. The main message that Muslims are getting right now, if I had to simplify it, was is this: please do something about those extremists. And by the way, we don't want you here. Uh. That's the message that a lot of Muslims in this country have been feeling this last week. And how do you how do you expect to have any progress when that's the message? Let me get some callers in. Looks like we have uh, Kwame from uh, Allentown joining us on Radio Times. Kwame, go ahead. You're on the air. Hello? Hi there. Go ahead. You're on the air. All right. My question is, why do Muslims demonstrate when there's a cartoon about Prophet Muhammad from Sudan to Afghanistan or from Egypt to Iran? Why we can come out and condemn, also demonstrate against this evil act? Yes, we are not responsible for the killing. But yes, we have the responsibility to distinguish ourselves from this barbarous act. Those that claim the name of Muslim to kill, why we can come out as a Muslim to condemn them, to demonstrate, to show to the world our demonstrations with me communicating to the rest of the people that these people does not represent all. This is not Islam. We are not part of this. Islam is a peaceful religion. We are not communicating. We are not talking. Well, Kwame, I appreciate the call to Radio Times. And Shahadi raises an interesting point about demonstrating against cartoons, uh, the cartoons of of the the prophet, uh, but not seeing the same level of demonstrations against some of these violent acts. Sure. Well, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And I think what people need to understand is, first of all, <clears throat> You know, there were no uh, not a, not only were there no protests in America against those cartoons, there was hardly a peep. Muslim communities in America were simply not bothered by it. Um, so I think people need to ask themselves, why was that? Uh. You know, so so you had basically, if you looked at protests that were happening around the world, the more dysfunctional those societies were, and politically and et cetera, the the more you would have these kinds of, of, of protests. But the more integrated and assimilated uh, Muslim communities were, it didn't even raise an eyebrow. So, so this is why, you know, when I was doing my work with the State Department, you know, and, and you see people doing these protests overseas, it's like, look, look at, look at the way American Muslims have handled themselves. America gave them a place to be fully Muslim and fully American, and when they're allowed to reach that, their full potential, 
the right thing happens. So how do we take what we've done here mm-hmm. successfully and amplify it for the world? That's an interesting comment. See, Mukhtar? Let, let me give an example. Someone asked me, why do these people burn U.S. flags, right, in, in the streets, in Karachi, in, in, in other parts of the Muslim world? I, I thought about it a lot, and I got it. When I get upset, I write an op-ed. And sometimes it will come out in Washington Post and in New York Times. Now, how does a, a person who can't write an op-ed uh, in Karachi protest U.S. foreign policy in Iraq? Uh, and how does he or she get on CNN? There is Th- no outlet. That is You're how saying. they get on it, through protest. Because we know that CNN will go out and cover. But let me also tell you that uh, my own experience with media this weekend is we did this fabulous conference which have, which would have countered some of these narratives so, so strongly, right? But there was no media. We sent information to 150 media outlets and nobody came and covered it. And even those who came, they were more interested in asking questions about ISIL. So there is a culpability uh, that the media seems to err on the side of the sensational uh, than the sensible. So, And then to complain that the sensible is not out there when sen- the sensation is privileged over it is, is, I think, completely unfair. And you must also understand that Muslims are less than 1% of this population. We are less than 1% of the population. We can't be everywhere. We can't be doing every day. Uh, and, and Shahid's point that, uh, that Muslims in the, the question is, why didn't the Muslims in the United States uh, update? Be- because except Philadelphia Inquirer, actually, nobody else published those cartoons. No, yeah, that's true. I, I certainly remember that as well. Uh, Shahed, I was nodding actually as Muktadar was talking about uh, the, the press coverage. I have CNN on over my shoulder here, and I can see you know just you know Donald Trump pretty much twenty four seven. So uh, I, I I can't defend that. I mean, we certainly talked about him during the show, but at, at the same time, I think there there is some truth to that that the press sort of feeds press broadly speaking is sort of feeding some of this fear. You know, you've had now uh, a, a generation of Muslim youth who've grown up reading about Islam on the front pages, seeing Islam in the headlines pretty much every day of their lives. And it's had a tremendous impact on them. Um, thankfully, I don't think it's been entirely negative. What it's done is it's helped make them resilient. It's helped make them proud and strong. Um, it's helped uh, force them to integrate in their communities and to, to, to build alliances. Um, and so, you know, uh, this is it, it becomes a teaching point. I use it with my own children. I mean, they always are seeing things about the news and we have a conversation about it. What does that mean for you being a Muslim? I want my kids to know and I want all Americans to know that, you know, if I did not believe that my faith was of benefit to this country, I would abandon it. Mm. I, I truly believe that it has something of benefit to people, not because I say so, but because I hope they would say so. Um, and I took an oath to defend this country when I joined the State Department, and I, you know, I I'd happily take a bullet for it. Um, and I know plenty of people, other people who would. These are the stories I want the press to talk about. I want the press to talk about that we just raised one hundred thousand dollars for the victims of the San Bernardino shootings in the last two days, just within the Muslim community. These are these are these are the success stories. I was also reading about uh, Muslims, uh, Muslim Americans also raising money to rebuild some of the black churches that had been yes. um, burned down over the last couple of years. It, me- it, it was the biggest fundraising campaign through the month of Ramadan. Launch Good, the company that did that, is actually housed in the incubator that I'm running. Um, and uh, they had dozens of Ramadan you know, uh, charities that were on there. The Rebuild Black Churches campaign was by far the largest of all the campaigns, Muslims deciding to help their fellow Americans. This is what I want people to know about. And unfortunately, I can't get Jane's call on uh, only because we're almost out of time. But this is to you, Muktadar. She says the meeting that they had in D.C. was in Delaware was great, very important. Uh, wouldn't have known about it. We need to sit down together. This is what we need to do more of. Obviously, agreeing with with I think both of you that uh, I, I guess perhaps this is a I'm not going to say a turning point, but it is a, a point at which we can deal with some of these issues that have not been dealt See, with. I teach a freshman class on Islam, and, and I meet people who come who are not corrupted by college yet. And one thing that I found about uh, a lot of Americans is that they have a very profound sense of justice. I think we do something in our public schools, in spite of all the bad things, is that they, they do develop a sense of justice and sense of fairness. So when they are exposed to, to alternative viewpoints, they are open to it. They are critically open to the point. But the, the, the thing is that uh, 
people also tend to think that if they hear something on television, it must be true. Mm -hmm. So if you have Donald Trump 24-7, those who are just skimming through, they will assume that what he's saying is true. Otherwise, why will he be on TV, right? This is not an entertainment channel. This is this is news and and that is a very big challenge for us that uh, that the, the issue of media responsibility is never raised I mean I think the same question that are asked of Muslims should be asked of media well on that note we're going to end our conversation Mukta Dar Khan thanks so much for joining us Thank today in Radio Times me. Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Delaware where he founded the Islamic Studies Program Shahed Amanula, thank you very much for joining us as well Thank you so much. You're welcome. Community leader, entrepreneur, and uh, founder of a couple of uh, media startups, also former senior advisor for technology at the U.S. State Department and uh, editor-in-chief of altmuslim.com. Go to whyy.org slash Radio Times, and you can find out much more about the program, including how to download a podcast of the show, find us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. I'm Marty Moscowain. Thanks for joining us in this first hour of Radio Times, and do stay with us. With us, we will be right back.